So good evening, good morning, everyone uh, who's joined us for this session on uh, Friday evening in India and Friday morning in the US. Um, thanks to Asha Impact and Naj for making this happen. I'm delighted to have uh, Vikram Gandhi join us from Boston. Um, Vikram needs very little introduction to most people in India, but I think the most relevant introduction for this topic on philanthropy and fundraising and blended finance in that is the fact that he's possibly seen it from all different sides. Uh, he's been an investment banker. He is a professor of uh, impact investing and entrepreneurship at Harvard. And he himself is an active impact investor as well as on boards of multiple companies, including Social Finance India, which operates in the blended finance space. So there can be very few people more qualified to talk about it than Vikram. So Vikram, welcome and thank you for making the time. Thank you, Shant. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. And just uh, for my introduction, my name is Shantanu Ghosh. I am the CEO of Social Finance India. Uh, we are a financial intermediary, not-for-profit uh, company. And we basically, our, our only mission is to bring blended finance to the development sector. And that's what we do across the world. We are part of a global network of social finance companies across the world. So delighted to speak on the topic of uh, philanthropy and fundraising and the role of blended finance in rebuilding the non-profit sector. So the way we're going to do this is we're just going to go through a little bit of primer on blended finance. We understand that there has been a masterclass done before this, but this is a little bit of a rejog of memory who have attended that. And for those who may not have attended that, just to set the definition. And then we will engage in a, in a set of questions and, and topics and discussions. And Vikram has promised not to hold back his punches. So we're going to have an interesting um, hour. Um, can we see the next page, please? Yeah, so blended finance, uh, there are sometimes misconceptions uh, because blended finance usually gets tagged with the most popular version or the most uh, talked about version of blended finance, which is impact bonds. But blended finance is beyond that. It's fundamentally any structure which uses developmental capital to mobilize commercial capital for achieving a development outcome. As long as those conditions are met, which is that there is a development capital, which then mobilizes commercial capital, there's a specific development outcome, and then the capital earns either a positive or a negative financial return, because there is also risk involved. Um, that particular kind of structure is called blended capital. And what you see at the bottom are many different types of instruments or tools that is in the toolkit of blended finance. Um, as you can see, impact bond is only one of them, but there's a whole bunch of models in terms of concessional credit, concessional debt, equity, investments, risk guarantee structures, and a whole bunch of that. And um, in, in terms of the way this has moved in the market across the world, a variety of these instruments have been used across different areas. There are obviously some instruments better suited for certain types of situations, and we'll talk about that subsequently. I don't know if you can go to the next page. So blended finance is has scaled up. If you look at the last 10 years, uh, the number of transactions has become eight or nine times. And the total capital deployed is about 130 billion plus. And this is uh, really data up to 2018 and the 2019 data wasn't easily available. Um, and in the recent times, there's an incremental commitment of 20, $25 billion. Uh, that's happening almost every year. Um, so it is, it started small, it has caught the fancy and it's been on a linear growth trajectory over the years. But if you can go to the next stage. Um, in terms of who provides this capital, um, you can see the commercial investor split on the left-hand side and it's a mix. Uh, there are financial institutions, there are corporates, there are the private equity venture capital, which is still very small. And then there are the asset managers and institutional funders. Um, clearly, the bulk of commercial capital has come from financial institutions and corporate. And if you go into the developmental uh, capital side, uh, again, you find a wide range of participants in the mix from development agencies to commercial to DFIs, to impact investors, to foundation NGOs and even sometimes commercial investors uh, playing that role. Um, I think the key point here is that the mix of the investors is less important than the variety of the objectives they are trying to solve for. 
and the fact that with that variety of objective, you're still aligning to a fundamentally generating a developmental goal. Uh, and that becomes very critical in the way you think about development finance, uh, blended finance in development. Up on the last page. Um, sorry, can go back. Yeah. Um, from a sector uh, specificity, um, I think the color coding is a little bit of challenge here, but uh, clearly energy, uh, financial services have had the bulk share in most of the places. Education has also had its uh, share, especially in some of the Asian um, region. What this chart doesn't show is from a world distribution perspective, Africa has had the bulk of blended finance instruments so far. Uh, India is roughly about 14, 15% of the world total. Um, and then most of the other stuff has happened in Asia with a little bit happening in, uh, in the Latin America and the Europe, Central Asia um, uh, region. So that was just a little bit of background because we thought it would be useful to demystify blended finance and talk a little bit about all the different things that it does. But this is not meant to be you know, going deep into the instruments and going deep into the structures. What we would love to do, uh, and, and where I'll bring Vikram in right now, is really talk a little bit about trend and talk about where is this going and, and why is it going there and what are the impediments that might be there. So Vikram, the first question really is, you know, we've seen the graph of blended finance growing you know, number of transactions growing pretty handsomely, but you know, at $130 billion, it's still a drop in the ocean. I mean, the SDGs require $4 trillion to be uh, invested and spent. So do you think that finally the day of blended finance has come or is it still in experimentation and proof of concept stage? Yeah, I don't, uh, thank you, Shantan. And again, I'm very happy to be here. So thank you uh, to uh, the organizers of Charcha 2020 to host this, as well as host the fabulous program that you have over the last uh, couple of days. Um, so I think blended finance, first of all, is not kind of a new concept, as you said in your first chart. You know, the concept around first loss provisions, currency hedging, insurance, and other forms of concessionary capital have kind of been around uh, for a while. Uh, but they have not, I mean, again, your chart show that has gone from, you know, 3 billion a year to 15 billion. Uh, but in the big scheme of things, as you rightfully pointed out, it's still a drop in the ocean. I mean, just, just to step back for a second as to why is this important, just beyond the charts. The, you know, the UN Sustainable Goals, which everyone is, is a bit familiar with, require about $7 trillion of spending on the 17 goals uh, to be achieved over the next decade or so. And essentially, the Private, uh, the public sector and philanthropy and other forms of development finance, you know, all of the IMF and World Bank and others have actually uh, emphasized that there will be a two and a half trillion dollar shortage per year, and that continues, if not more. I mean, Shantanu, you mentioned four trillion. Um, and so, if you put that in the context of that, we need to bring two to three trillion dollars or even more of private capital to address some of these important sustainable goals. Uh, we are way short and a 15 billion blended finance is not going to solve the problem. So the question really is that it's been great progress and um, you know, where do we need to get from here? The other thing that's really relevant from an India standpoint, since that's the focus of this, uh, of this dialogue, is the fact that if you look beyond, before the sustainable goals, there were the millennial goals. And by and large, the millennial goals, which were eight goals, were generally viewed as highly successful and on an aggregate basis. And the reason they were viewed as highly successful is because China, through various development programs, lots of blended finance, which we don't call blended finance, but that's essentially what it was from the point of view of co-opting private capital and government spending a lot of money. Uh, and through an export driven strategy, essentially pulled the, the numbers of people pulled out of poverty is what led to millennial goals actually being achieved. And it's in the history of mankind, that amount of people coming out of poverty in such a short period of time is unprecedented. Why is this relevant now for, for India and the SDGs? For the SDGs to actually be successful and be achieved, India has to actually pull its weight. Uh, and, that's, and, and, and we know that. We know that all 17 issues exist in India and there are lots of great initiatives going on. So that's one, as to the context of why this is so critical in India. Second is the whole issue of blended finance and et cetera. You know, this is not new news. I mean, I could be saying the same thing in December. So the question is what has, if anything, COVID kind of brought to the forefront? And I think what it's brought to the forefront is that if you look at three or four pillars of kind of society, 
you have the government and the public sector, you've got the corporate sector, you've got investors, and you've got philanthropy and charitable giving in the NGO sector. And typically, they're somewhat operated in, in silos. Blended finance, basically, by definition, blends these characters together or these silos together. And I think what COVID will do or has done, and I think that's why we're having this dialogue, will accelerate that process. The ability for development finance institutions, the government, and philanthropy to really focus on the fact that how do we make our spending better in terms of return on social investment? And is there a way to collaborate in such a way that we can co-opt trillions of dollars of commercial capital into these areas? Because a lot of them do not lend themselves in the initial days when there's high risk, uncertain business models, uncertain outcomes. There's a high risk element which commercial capital will not, will not kind of venture on. And so therefore the ability to de-risk that becomes all the more critical. So I'll say it's a big issue. It has been a big issue. And our hope is actually that um, you know, the COVID will bring a lot of these things to the forefront and focus our efforts on bringing those partnerships. I mean, blended finance is just another way of bringing public, private, philanthropy, commercial capital investors together. Yeah, so Vikram, I, I want to actually pick up on that com uh, comment that you make on bringing the private, public and everything together. Because, you know, in India so far, on the few quote unquote impact bonds that has happened, we haven't had government being an outcome funder. Now, that's only a few impact bonds. That's really not the whole of blended finance as we discussed. So there is a there is a belief that in India, you have to find a way of doing blended finance without the government. And obviously, scaling without that is really not a feasible option. So how do you see from an Indian context, the development of blended finance and the sort of mix between government, between commercial, between other development capital? Uh, how do you see that play out and evolve? Yeah. So again, I think the Indian government is not new, is not unaware of blended finance. I mean, we set up development financial institutions 70 years ago, right? If you look at, you know, the, the public-private partnerships and the roads, I mean, essentially that's blended finance because the government is providing cap certain amounts of capital and de-risking the private sector. Now, it didn't quite work out because there was too much risk put on the private sector. So the first round of toll roads and all that have, been a, have not been a great financial success in, most, in a lot of cases. But now the government's learned from that and is actually now the private public partnerships are around, we'll build the roads and then we'll re recycle by bringing in commercial capital at the right time. So I think the mindset of blended finance there in government, I think the issue right now is that if you look at this a package that was announced by the finance minister a couple of days ago, it's highly targeted towards middle, uh, towards uh, small businesses middle, uh, and micro businesses, which are a core part and NGOs, which are a core part of what blended finance instruments are all about. So they also, you all, they also recognize that there's only so much they can spend. So I think there's a gr growing realization in the government that bringing partnership between public and private sector and, and philanthropy and NGOs, by the way, together is becoming more urgent. So my guess is that if we can, if we can streamline some of these structures, my, my view is that these still are highly complicated, they're confusing, they lend themselves to all kinds of conflicts potentially, um, they can be pretty costly. So I, I think till we maybe figure out how to kind of address that issue, uh, bringing in the government may be a little more challenging, but I think we can work with the government. I mean, they are fully aware of outcome bonds. I know the World Bank has spent time with them on, on going through potential uh, uh, education-oriented, education, education -oriented, health oriented bonds. So I would, in fact, rather than this being a Q&H, Shantanu, you've now been, you know, you were a senior, man, senior uh, part of the senior management, one of the biggest corporations that really is the master at scaling, Genpac. Um, and so how do you think about your, now that you've been in social, the CEO of social finance a couple of, of months, as to how can we take, which is actually a great instrument, it is focusing philanthropic and development capital on outcomes rather than on budgets. If the outcome is not achieved, the philanthropy of the government does not pay, and you're bringing in commercial capital to earn a certain amount of return to compensate them for that risk. But again, they've been very small. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I, I think, uh, Vikram, you're exactly right. I don't think government has been absent from the sector. If anything, I think they've been hugely present in the sector. It's sometimes hard to understand in what all different ways they play. So for example, if you think of the area of skilling, you know, the kind of blended finance support they give through National Skill Development Corporation has been there for a while and they're doing, and it's only got accelerated and expanded. Um, if you think of education, and if you think about ed tech in education, which is where a whole bunch of thinking and, and initiatives are going on, 
frankly, you cannot solve it without the government paving the way for the core infrastructure and access. Right. No. And I think some of these conversations and initiatives and programs, we take for granted that what has already happened. I think what we need to do, and I think education is a classic example. I mean, the biggest discussion now going on in India is how do you create a sustainable model of education, which is both in classroom and outside. And I think Vikram, you're obviously absolutely in the heat of that conversation, even in Harvard and other colleges. And if you think about that, unlike Harvard and other colleges, you can't take access for granted. So in a government school student, it's okay to find a technology software which works at home, uh, but it has to work at a very low uh, download speed and it has to work in a device which is not there in 50-60% of the home. So first you have to solve access problem, then you have to yeah. solve a uh, hierarchy of need problem, then you have to solve technology problem, then you have to solve pedagogy problem, then you have to solve adoption problem. Yeah, and you know, just on that point, you know, in, in my HBS class, in our entrepreneurship, we have actually a case on Khan Academy, which you just taught a couple of weeks ago, and the surge that they're seeing in the last couple of months because of what's happening, Baiju's, Avanti, you know, others are also seeing that, but you've got to build the infrastructure around it too, like you rightly say. So again, it becomes a partnership issue between the between public and private sector. Correct, and I, I think if you want to solve those kind of problems, you actually have no option but to think of the government as partner and have to find ways in which their investment can be fully utilized and leveraged instead of just thinking of them putting money on the table, which is possibly easier for some of the other participants in that, in that mode to do. Um, and, and actually, the, the COVID discussion uh, creates more impetus for that need because it actually then exa exaggerates the inequality and division. Um, essentially an access to device on an education is a big inequality issue uh, right. if they have to do from home. Um, let me move a little bit from the government discussion to the commercial capital, because this is something which obviously you have dealt with at uh, in, in, in lots of different ways and in depth. Uh, how complicated is it for one to solve risk, return and impact? I mean, just to get two variables in the game and find some equation, risk and return, yeah. Yeah. took a few decades to sort of for the markets to mature and more, more than more than a few decades more than a few decades <laughs> right. and people still argue about risk metrics so it's okay correct now you, now you put in a third dimension and we all know that now the now there's no binary answer now the answers become uh, multivariate so how, how difficult is it to solve for that how it, it is it is a very it is a very complicated uh, topic and it's like but it's an evolving topic i mean if you look look back 100 years right i mean when people were making investments they were just thinking about return and then over a period of time, and this is not that long ago, right? And over a period of time, people realize, well, if I'm generating the same return in three different investments, but they have significantly different risk profiles, I'm actually not getting the same return. And so then there was for 50 years, a whole body of knowledge starting from Black Scholes and others on option value creation, on risk adjust, risk metrics, et cetera, which again, today, if you, you know, ask companies about their risk analysis, et cetera, three companies of the same industry would probably come up with slightly different answers. So there again is no really one formula. And therefore third, throwing in a third dimension, as you say, is more complicated. Having said that, I think the kind of what we call term, and it's kind of one of those cliche kind of terms, which is reimagining capitalism, is that we actually do need to do that. Investors have to think about not just risk and return, but impact for two reasons. One is, you know, the traditional reason or values that the that, that capital should play a certain role in a, in, a, in forwarding certain social objectives. You know, those social objectives have now in the last five years manifested themselves in the UN Sustainable Goals, which is like not the North Star, which is great. Um, so there's that values thing. But I think what now investors are realizing is that this is not just a values thing. This is a value thing, and those two are actually not inconsistent. So think about it. If you are a long-term investor and have a 15, 20 year time horizon, like most big investors globally do, pension plans, endowments, family offices, which have multi-generational needs. Um, so there, there's a huge kind of long-term perspective. And if you don't factor in when you're making an investment as what is the long-term impact of climate on this company? What is the long-term impact of income inequality in the community that this company operates in? What is the impact of the fact that this company is run by white males and there's no, no gender diversity, nothing at the top, or, or Indian males? But, um, and what, so what is the impact of all these various things? What is the impact of you know, water kind of running, the, climate, uh, the, the, the world running out of water? 
So if you don't actually think about those things and factoring in the ability of that company or that particular investment that you're making to deal with those issues, you're probably not making good investments. But so, so I think a lot of investors or most investors are realizing that. The issue really is how do you bring it into your investment analysis? And it gets back to the blended capital discussion, which is that you've got to figure out that am I for the impact that I'm having, generating the risk and return, but more importantly, my risk and re my return is dependent on the fact that this impact metrics that the company kind of is focused on, you know, play out over time. So put that's put put it putting it another way, the fact is that most com most large investors now are focused on the impact aspect of this, the ESG aspects of it, and it's showing up in valuations. By the way, you know, we did an analysis in the last two months since COVID hit, say, the markets towards the end of February. And the companies which have consistently been overweight in indices that are ESG oriented, that those companies do well on ESG, uh, have, have, a, have a significant PE premium to the other companies. And that PE premium has only increased for the last two months. And this is again, not about companies just, you know, if you go to Bloomberg terminal and all that, they're like 700 or 600 ESG metrics. This is about focusing on the three or four things that matter to companies for big, good business success. And so the role of investors through blended finance instruments, through direct equity investments, is to really encourage managements to focus on those three or four things which are critical for business success. Now that kind of sounds obvious that they should, but unfortunately a lot of managements don't do that. So I think that's where investors and where the impact comes into the equation. Yeah, so Vikram, do you, do you think that, you know, over the many decades that uh, sort of inverse correlation that got established between risk and return, right? So, you know, or, or the direct correlation, lower the risk, you know, lower the uh, return expectation, higher the risk, higher the return. Do you think um, we can establish that kind of uh, inverse correlation between impact and return expectation? Well, I don't think there'll be inverse, inverse correlation. There should be positive correlation, right? So the more impact, the more return. And that's what you're shooting for. Um, yeah. So it's as opposed to an inverse correlation. But in the I initial that, stages to, yeah. to spur innovation, to, to yeah. create risk taking, where actually the risk premium goes high, you don't know what the yeah. impact model is. Yeah. Uh, would you think that that balance in the initial stages of the growth and market making, there is a case to be made, especially with focus towards multivariate stakeholders now, and then yeah. sort of, you know, going beyond just that the shareholder is the only person we are accountable to kind of model. Yeah, correct. So the multi-stakeholder, the business council came about, and I think that again, this COVID issue is accelerating that, that to the forefront. Um, yeah, so I, I think so the high impact kind of investment or interventions, typically the two, truly high impact ones, will not necessarily generate an immediate risk adjusted return because the risk levels, like you say, are very high. And that's where in, it's, really, it's really in those situations where you, know, you do need some sort of development funding, some sort of philanthropic funding, some sort of funding to come in and buffer the returns. Let me give an example of that. So one of the key issues, climate being forefront of everyone's discussion as it should be in India as well, is that even if all the companies kind of shoot towards the Paris, all the countries, Paris, the Paris Agreement are, are successful in reducing you know, temperature increases to one and a half degrees, we still will not reach where we need to get to reach to. That is, we have to suck carbon out of the air. And so the question right now is that there are not enough technologies out there that can actually do this in an efficient, cost-effective manner. And there's not enough capital going into that because it's viewed as a very long-term, high-risk, and so therefore, even the venture capitalists, et cetera, are not kind of focused on that in a meaningful way. So this is where, you know, Bill Gates set up this thing called Clean Energy Ventures. There are a whole bunch of other initiatives where it's more patient, 20-year capital, maybe looking for returns that are market-based. But if you look at the risk, probably they're not getting market-based returns. But they are kind of coming in and trying to, you know, invest in some of these things so that more mainstream venture capital, private equity, and then maybe the public markets at some stage come into these, into these investment vehicles. So that's one example. And you yeah. see many examples like that, which could, would happen in India as well. Yeah, in fact, Vikram, I would think that one of the risk mitigation um, models here fundamentally is the fact that a blended finance forces you to be a lot more focused on design, uh, forces yeah. you to be a lot more focused on definition of outcome and the determination of the right outcomes. And yeah. obviously it completely by order of magnitude increases the, uh, the, the requirement and the rigor on measurement and evaluation. And right. that, as we know, and that's not just 
not just for the social sector that's across anywhere any on any aspect of life or commercial sector if you do those three things you fundamentally dramatically increase your chances of success or chances of results as opposed to failing so i think that's one of the biggest ways of actually how there is an inbuilt model of risk mitigation um leaving aside of course very large innovation uh, or risky innovation models yeah, um, yeah. which actually then uh, vikram takes me to the question on one of the big critiques of blended finance because blended finance has has been ostensibly to drive innovation because that's where normal grant is not there you are trying out something new and you are you therefore bring in different types of capital if it's successful you sort of scale up do you really think that that has been a hypothesis which is proven or you think the jury is out on that i i think the jury is out on that i mean i i don't think that i mean clearly there has been innovation um i mean where does innovation happen so innovation happens in universities innovation happens in in various government departments innovation happens in companies innovation happens in new business models and nonprofits so there's a lot of on the ground innovation happening but i mean most statistics would show that the quality and the level of innovation happening now compared to just as a percentage of money spent as a percent of gdp or revenues of a company etc is on the downturn so i i i think again i'm hopeful that in areas of public health education um you know sustainable cities things like that that covid-19 will accelerate innovation and capital going into these things i mean keep in mind that obviously we are all suffering you know you're you're in gurgaon been sitting inside uh, for for the last couple of months my friends i mean i was supposed to go back to mumbai last week i can't really go back because there are no flights so the the issue is that um you you you've got kind of a real degree of urgency and obviously huge hits to the economy but think about the fact that this is something which was everyone's problem but there was a high degree of urgency and everyone kind of came together and it's continued to come together to try and address this problem whether it be within india globally etc or there will be politics there will be issues the problem with climate and quite honestly at least whatever data i've seen is that if climate kind of change comes to fruition what 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 the impact that we have through covid-19 will be minuscule compared to what will happen in terms of income inequality migration you know droughts and the whole lot and the disappearance of coastal coasts so it's it's magnitudes but the fact is it's a longer term thing and therefore it's no one's problem right it's a it's a collective action problem with no time urgency to it and so there again the hope is that this will, this realization over here will bring things like that to the forefront that that the private sector philanthropy and the government need to come together in a much more coordinated manner and hopefully you know regulation is critical and we unfortunately have you know one of the largest economy or the largest economy in the world kind of not really taking this too seriously at least at the government level and so i think hopefully my hope is that this will accelerate that that process and and vikram i think also think there are different types of innovation there's a product innovation there is a delivery awesome. or a service innovation there is a scaling up innovation there is a way of operational innovation and i think uh, i wouldn't paint the entire picture with the same brush because i do think blended finance in many of the areas has actually uh, sparked a bunch of scaling up and operational innovation i think yeah. the jury is out on whether it can go to completely uncharted territories of complete new products new services stuff like that and having said that i think um, what covid is doing especially again a few examples in education and skilling that i am seeing because those are the areas we are um, in very interested in seems to be that it can actually go and do the product and service innovation also i think in the past some of the models have been a little more conservative in taking proven uh, interventions and then really using blended finance to scale up but yeah. uh, there seems to be now a um, a situation an environment where you can actually use it for even product and service innovation just beyond scaling up an operational right but shantu i think you should talk about that a little bit in terms of social finance right i mean it's a new thing in india we just set this up in the last whatever 6 months you've come on as ceo and i know we there's an example in in africa and how we can potentially replicate that in india maybe good for the audience to hear that yeah absolutely and i would actually put that into the uh, into the bucket of the other critic that we were that that has come up in fact there's a question also and i'll just pull that and and use it in that uh, area where someone has said this is an interesting point which they have said that um you know d- blended finance has been like a designer uh, clothing it's like the rohit bals line and how does it become ma- mass clothing uh, 
Um, and I think that has been one of the critics that it hasn't been scaled up. There are too many small uh, quote unquote independent structures being done. Um, and I think that's a very valid uh, critic. Uh, Vikram, if I were to ask you, and then I'll go into the, 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 the point that you were making. If I were to ask you, what do you think would make it become a lot more scalable? What are one or two things from a structural perspective, framework perspective, would you think uh, could make it really scalable? Yeah, so I, I think from a structural perspective, first of all, I think we need to have a few, and now let's talk about say impact bonds and a few of those specific structures first, but you know, okay, so why the things that have been around for a long time and why have they not kind of gone to a whole new level like development financial institutions providing concessionary capital, et cetera, is that you, you or the governments for that matter, is that A, the amount of capital that's actually been put behind that is not enough, that's one. Uh, but two is that to actually go from the point of view that of, of making something happen to the end result is there are so many hurdles from a procedural standpoint, a documentation standpoint, and a cost standpoint, like you say, to for, for some valid reasons. I mean, the point is that as soon as there's development money, government money floating around, people are concerned that it'll be misused in some way, et cetera. So you constantly, or there's this, this issue of, you know, should we be really using development money to actually help private capital actually earn a return and the conflicts inherent in that. So I, I think those are, these are some of the hurdles that have actually come in the way of things. My guess is the best way to actually get something really scale up is to have a few successes, few successes at scale, which is what we're hoping with social finance and a bunch of others is that if we can have a few successes at scale. Where, so this works. You can bring different parties with different kinds of objectives together and you can do it in a reasonably short period of time at scale, at low cost. I think that's really what we need. And we don't have you know, these complicated impact bond structures have also been around globally for a long period of time. The, num the amounts involved are very, very tiny just because they've not been able to get this hurdle of a success factor of doing it at low cost and at scale. And so that's a hope that we can do a few of those and get a few success stories out there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll pick up on that uh, comment on scale. Um, and I think there's one way of getting that skill, by no means the only way, is to really think of more uh, pooled funds concept, as opposed to an independent or an individual program uh, funding model. Uh, and what do I mean by the difference? So let's take education, where we have had a few impact bonds, including one which we have done with CSR money. It's very focused on one or two providers in one or two places with a specific type of uh, intervention and it's uh, bound by you know three years that intervention will roll through. So it's, a, it's one project, right? Um, but having now done that and having done a bunch of others, there is absolutely possibility and merit in thinking about a pooled concept of let's say education outcome, learning outcome, which is what a bunch of those projects have done which now operates across at scale, across multiple states, multiple you know, districts, um, which has very similar kind of design structure, even if there may be different types of providers involved in many different places, even if you know the benchmarks may be different because you have to be very local in your outcome definition. But the structure, yeah. the concept, the thinking, the, the, uh, the model of financing, the, the, it becomes very, very similar. And it becomes what we, we would love to do is called an outcome fund. Um, and this is not just theory because, you know, today there is an outcome fund on, on primary education in um, Africa, uh, which has already got uh, designed and, you know, it's in the design comp is completed. Obviously COVID came, so implementation will happen whenever it can sort of go, uh, get through. Um, and a very similar model, for example, can happen in skilling. Uh, you know, in India, for example, there is a whole move on mass skilling, which uh, based on COVID and everything that's happening on livelihood, uh, possibly has never been more needed. And, and we all know that in the skilling, the results of skilling vary dramatically, depending on how good the process of that skilling run, even for the same type of, uh, you know, uh, vocation, same type of pedagogy. But how do you create the whole process from demand generation to the to the mapping to the to mobilization of students creates dramatically different outcome results, which basically is how many of those people skilled earn a, a sustainable livelihood because that's what you're skilling them for. Now, if you see today, there are a bunch of players who are at scale who are doing a, who are doing these and they are producing variation in outcome. 
And there are now evidence that there are certain types of mechanisms through which that variation of outcome can be reduced and obviously the mean improved. And again, that therefore creates the opportunity to create a pooled fund and have multiple people do multiple different skilling in multiple different places and sort of run that. And the moment you do that, your cost of that fund on a per unit basis is dramatically and geometrically lower. It's order of magnitude lower than trying to do it for individual. So I think the scaling problem and the scaling critic is absolutely valid, but uh, I am very optimistic and I find there are, there are paths which, which can uh, overcome that. And I, I, would add, I would add to that is that our hope, uh, my hope anyway, is that you know, COVID has created two issues, right? One is I think just the acceleration of urgency of a lot of these matters which we talked about, but the other side of that is also depleted you know, resources available for all this, right? I mean, my guess is this year, uh, CSR funding will be down by 50% or whatever. So therefore the availability of capital there has gone down. You know, will the government have enough resources given that they have to spend on this emergency funding for COVID? So there's the short term issue, which I think we'll have struggling with, you know, with capital in some front. But I'm talking more about medium and longer term that hopefully this kind of crisis, if you will, you know, like I said, never waste a crisis. Hopefully this crisis, if you will, um, will bring together innovation in these areas which we haven't seen before, which has really been on paper as opposed to being in practice. And that what would drive that is again, the fact that you know, things like this can really destroy the economy and therefore we need to deal with other issues on the horizon here. Uh, but second also is that for every dollar that we spend or rupee that we spend on, on development and on social issues, we got to try and figure out how we can generate a higher return on that. Just like you know, in the private sector, you're always constantly trying to figure out how you get better returns for shareholders and other stakeholders. In this case, how do we get a better return for taxpayers, for philanthropists, and that you know, models like you're talking about and blended finance can ho hopefully kind of move us in that direction. Sure. So um, Vikram, I'm going to pick up one of the questions which has been asked, and this is really in today's uh, situation, the, one of the elephants in the room, which is uh, in India, um, how badly will CSR funding get affected? Um, and I don't know anyone has a, has a, has a number or an answer uh, because we are dealing with uh, three different headwinds there, if I may. One headwind is just the fact that there is going to be less money because of less profits um, and therefore uh, less compulsion of money. Um, what, is the, what is your estimate of that, Shant? No, I heard like 50% lower or something. Yeah, I mean, I think that estimate depends on how long, uh, whether whether that eternal debate of V-shaped or U-shaped or L-shaped recovery, because the profits are a function of that, right? Uh, I think my base case is a new shape, so which is 50% is probably where I have put my money on. Um, mm. So that's one headwind. The second headwind is obviously a bunch of money has been put into immediate relief on COVID. Uh, and I think there's a third headwind, which I have seen throughout my life on any big event or crisis or transformation situation is the lack of decision making. And, and you know, people freeze because, you know, you, you can't make uh, strategic calls for next two, three years. Yeah. Um, so with all of that, it's a bad situation. Now, Vikram, do you see any way, um, and CSR money obviously in India has been 2% of you know, average profits and all that. Do you see that actually corporates post once they get a little bit clarity on where the business is going, actually is going to say, no, actually 2% is not the point. Uh, we will spend a little more because again, that's the multitude of stakeholders that I'm, I'm focused on. And I think there is a need to be nation building and also uh, do you have any views? I mean, you obviously talked to a bunch of CEOs and stuff. What, what's your... Yeah, I, I, um, I'm not as optimistic as maybe, maybe others are that, that suddenly there'll be this awakening that we should spend more money on CSR. Um, I, I do think that a lot of companies do actually spend more than 2%. Um, I think this whole issue of stakeholder, you know, keep in mind that the stakeholder focus ultimately still, you know, what's different, right? I'll, you know, if you go to all these business schools and MBAs, et cetera, or I, mean, I teach as well, is that you know if you don't treat your employees well, if you're not kind of friendly with the community and help develop the community, if you don't treat your customers properly, if you don't treat your suppliers properly, your profits and your companies are going to get hurt. So there are actually there's been this whole issue of well, what's new in the stakeholder thing? By definition, you got to be good at those four or five things, and that gets to ESG issues. Like those are all basically ESG issues, if you will. Um, that that's that's just good business. I think what's changed is that where companies are saying that we will not just measure shareholder returns 
and shareholder profits. We're also going to have metrics to measure these four or five other things. And so therefore, from that perspective, I think more money will be spent because people believe that this will actually lead to long-term shareholder value creation. And so therefore, there will be more money. Now, whether that's called CSR and it's kind of grant money, I'm not sure. Um, you know, as you know, there was a huge backlash when the stupas, I mean, it's one of the only countries actually in the world, which I think is a positive, is that one of the only countries which require corporations to spend a certain percentage of their profits on, on CSR activities. So my guess is it probably won't go up. Um, my also my guess is in the next couple of years and I get, I, I know I'm harping on the government so much and maybe that's not the right thing to do. But the fact is that at least all the companies that I speak with and given the fact that I represent an advisor of a big pension plan that has a big exposure in India is that, you know, their investment plans to a large extent, unless it's driven by, you know, this internet kind of off online stuff, which is maybe growing, most other investment plans are going to be put on hold for a while, eh? because of the uncertainty, like you said, as well as that, you know, there's just lack of capital. Um, and so therefore the government, I think, is going to step in in a big way. And that's where I again get back to the fact, I mean, they will have to spend a lot more on infrastructure than they have in the past. They will hopefully spend a lot more on some of the soft infrastructure and there too. That's why I think getting a few champions in the government, going and talking to them about the fact that you're gonna be spending this much more. You need to get the economy going because the private sector is not gonna do it. But how can you do it in such a way that you actually co-op private sector capital through blended finance instruments? Yeah, in fact, I'll pick up that point on both government as well as, um, you know, the corporate spending for the ESG kind of goals. Um, and I think one of the routes, which is what I find very positive for blended finances. I mean, if you think about it, just conceptually, it's possibly easier to go and talk to government on an outcome fund rather than one single program and yeah. have them sort of come in as a part investor, B part facilitator, or whatever it is, because you know, in, in India, for example, anything that you do, you actually ride a lot on government infrastructure and government uh, channels and government delivery mechanisms, right? So even making that as a facilitation is a big part of the game. Um, so I actually think that's that's one positive. The second is coming back to your your point on corporates and ESG. Again, if you think about other than a few companies which have had their solid management of the CSR money. A lot of uh, CSR has been basically check writing based on a little bit like, you know, the, the average guy doing mutual fund investment. When I have some money, I sort of figure out which it's, is the it's highest. Not, it's, not been, it's not been strategic. I think that's changing now, but it's not been strategic. Correct. And that again, if you go with good blended finance programs and, and, this, uh, and, and proposals, which has very clear outcome, which resonates with their ESG priorities. Um, I think there is a chance for that capital to be pretty significantly enhanced. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'd like to think that those are opportunities. While obviously, I, I, the, think they're big, I think they're big opportunities. And that's why I'm just encouraging people who are listening to this to really not kind of write that off, but actually find, depending on whether you're in education, healthcare, you know, whatever area of focus, agriculture, whatever area of focus, or housing, whatever focus there may be, is to really find a few champions, whether it be central governments or state governments, and go to them. I mean, you know, again, I find we always say the government. I mean, my experience has been that, you know, you find if there's some fantastic people in government. And so you just need to find the right person who's smart, innovative, hardworking, kind of wants to collaborate. And there are lots of them out there. And so I think this will hopefully, again, accelerate that process and dialogue, which should hopefully lead to better outcomes. Uh, Vikram, what do you think about, you know, pools of... Um capital, commercial capital coming from private investors, you know, the home offices, the, the big uh, group of private investors with different modes and different groups. Um, how do you think of that in terms of that group's exposure um, going up in, in the blended finance space? Do you see that in increasing? Do you see, do you think- so that I, I, think we need to separate, I think we need to separate the two buckets. So there's the family offices, which, you know, again, you know, in India, a family answer concept there's more newer concepts and there's seen in so much wealth generation here in the last 10, 20 years, whether it be the tech industry, the healthcare industry and others. And there have obviously been family offices from some of the more traditional industries and industrialists. So, and the family offices, you know, there's, there's some data which says that in the next 20 years, about $40 trillion globally of family office money will go from the older generation to the younger millennial generation who actually think about these issues in a much more proactive kind of, you know, these are not mutually exclusive things of doing good and doing well at the same time. 
And so, so that's one bucket. The other bucket is the pension plans and the endowments, which clearly have fiduciary obligations. They cannot be doing things which are viewed as subpar returns because there's a development agenda attached to that. I mean, their fiduciary obligations do not allow them to do that. Where they are coming out, so those are two buckets. So let me just deal with each one real quick. The family offices, I think, have been at the forefront of, of being creative on the blended finance structures, which is because they, they can express their values through their portfolio. And I think that's where I would argue that we should also focus our efforts in India. There have been, you know, as I said, a lot of family wealth that has been created here uh, in the last uh, two decades. Um, some of it may have been kind of tarnished in the last couple of months, but I'm sure it'll come back. Um, and so I think there too, we have, I mean, I have dialogues with quite a few of them. They are starting to think about these. And so I think that's a big pool of capital to, tar to tar target. I think this, the other piece, which is on the pension plans and all, you know, their focus on ESG is for two reasons. One is risk reduction, like I said. I mean, they're long-term shareholders, so therefore they got to make sure that governance structures, climate, and other things are not going to impair the long-term value of their investment. So that's risk reduction. And the second is to actually find alpha. I mean, companies that are going to outperform because, again, the data clearly suggests that companies that do well on the three or four ESG things that matter to their business outperform financially and in the stock market. You know, it's kind of motherhood and apple pie. It's such an obvious statement, but it doesn't always happen. So I think those folks are focused on that. So my guess is that they will target companies that have those in India, but, you know, would they invest in a broad but lended pool structure where it's unclear what the risk adjusted return is. And that, again, there's no track records. That's why I get back to the issue of having a few successes which show track records. Then you'll find some of these fellows kind of interested in it right now, they just aren't there. And it has to be at scale. So right. big pools of capital for them to write a check less than 100 million, 150 million, just doesn't make any sense. So it's gotta be at scale. Right. I'm going to take one question which has come from uh, one of the service providers. And I think uh, the question basically says that how much of innovation flexibility would blended finance offer to the service provider to sort of adjust the operations and stuff like that? And, and maybe I'll just take a shot and then Vikram, please. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, I actually think blended finance is designed for providing that flexibility. And there have been lots of examples. I mean, right from the very... Uh, well-known example of Educate Girls, uh, where Safina keeps talking about how she recalibrated her approach and then fundamentally changed the, the way, the, the performance of that particular dip uh, to the one that is currently going on quality education, where, you know, if you talk to Aditya Nataraj or whoever else, and they have in fact rejigged the providers based on performance uh, after one or two years. So I think actually from a definition perspective, it is designed to create flexibility for innovation. And, and by the way, it's operational innovation. So therefore you are adjusting what will allow you to get to uh, better results. Uh, if it doesn't, then I think it's a, it's a bad design. It's not inherent in the framework of the model is the way I'll, I'll position it. Uh, but in that, in that context, though, Shantanu, so you know, in the, in, as a service provider, you're given certain metrics that you've got to hit. Right, you have a scorecard and, and all that, like every year. And so, if, if if while during the year they find that there's some innovation to do, how flexible can the structures be to actually make that happen? I think it's a lot more flexible than any of the other traditional grant or funding structures, because in the grant funding structures, you are following a cost line item model, right? And you are having that as your measurement and evaluation and variation conversation. Whereas here you're having a conversation on the variation of results and you're doing a classic, you know, if Y is different then which are the X's that you need to change and whether this X changing is better ROI versus changing another X kind of model. So you're doing those kind of conversations. Now, as, as you and I both know, it is sometimes tough to create the balance scorecard and, and to drive those uh, transfer functions. And so if it doesn't happen well, it's because that scorecard was faultily done, not because the scorecard was, the framework needed the scorecard. Yeah, yeah. There's also, you know, in terms of the industries that have attracted, as one of your earlier charts showed, was basically energy and financial services. To a large extent, again, because those are reasonably, you can, you can see the return profile in a reasonably yeah. short period of time. Yeah. And also you can actually deploy money at scale. Um, and that's, you know, uh, again, the hope is that through what you're doing, Shantanu, which is great, and maybe on the healthcare side, somebody else comes up with good ideas, 
is that how to kind of deploy capital at scale in industries or in areas where you don't see immediate results, right? It happens over a period of time. And yeah. therefore you need to be patient and see how that progress happens. Right. And, and all, also even where you can actually see results within a reasonable period of time and sometimes in pretty short cycles, which for example is in skilling. Right? Yeah. Um, and there actually you can do capital at scale because just, you know, the good thing about India is if you find a, a decent program, uh, putting a few zeros behind is not a problem. No, exactly. <laughs> any problem that in, in India exists, it exists uh, any problem that exists in the world exists in India at scale. So India doesn't have a scale problem. <laughs> right. Uh, let me see if there is any other specific question which we need to take. Um, I think there's a question on any thoughts on the feasibility of carrier impact bonds in India or more generally outside the US context. And I know Vikram, you have done actually a case study with social finance US um, yeah. and talked about career impact bonds. So why don't you give your perspective and then I'll, I'll, I'll add on. Yeah, so I think the career impact bonds for those who are not familiar with it is, is also a little bit of a blended finance structure, but essentially, you know, you, uh, education finance is, is a huge asset class in the US in terms of lending people to go to school, college and school. Um, and it's, in fact, being termed right now as one, the next big financial services bub financial bubble to burst. Uh, it was till COVID came along and kind of uh, made that a, a small issue. Uh, but um, essentially what this career impact bond that social finance does is you know, lends to a student and then based on the student's jo job, gets a certain percentage of that uh, income back up to a max amount. So, um, so basically it's sharing, essentially sharing in the future income stream of a student. And if the student doesn't earn anything, then the career impact bond is worth nothing. Um, but it has been a success because it creates, uh, both gives students opportunity, has created a kind of a motivation level. And now I know uh, Social Finance US is trying to launch a separate, a new fund, which are only focused on, they tried this on an experimental basis and now are um, so I would think that in India, something like this should work too. I mean, I don't know what your view is, Shantan. No, absolutely, it will work. Um, I think obviously what the, mo the model that you talked about was the income service agreement kind of model within Career Impact Bond. I think there are other flavors and variations you can do with the fundamental view that, you know, if you create sustainable livelihood opportunity for someone who gets skilled, then you can, you can have that beneficiary pay you back. And, and pay back a premium. I mean, yeah. and I think there are many variations of that. So the short answer to that question is absolutely yes. And in many different variations. And that's something which we are actively focused on. Yeah. Um, there is no other question Vikram. What, how do you want to uh, just paint the picture? If you were to think of this, you know, three years or four years from now, um, and if you had to bet with your own money, um, would you think that Blended finance has sort of accelerated. Uh, it has gone on the same sort of uh, trajectory or it has actually gone down. Uh, how do you- no, I, I, think, I, I think it has, uh, there's another person who just raised his hand uh, to ask, uh, anyway. Uh, so um, there are two others. I, I, think it will, I think it will accelerate. I mean, I just, again, the, the, uh, the, you know, the urgency with how COVID has kind of brought to the forefront such with such a, some important issues will hopefully resonate with, with folks. And, you know, in, in India, the, the impact bonds is that if you just focus on one aspect of it, it's only just starting up. So my guess is and my hope is that by educating philanthropists, by educating government, by educating investors, and, and again, showing a few early successes, um, you know, I think we will, we will see a lot more in three or four years. And not just in India, I think uh, globally. I mean, this is a book, big, big push area, even from the World Bank and the IFC and others. Uh, to really kind of get this on a totally different trajectory than it has been in the past. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. I, I think though, this is not just going to happen. So my, my, and my hope is like, for example, at Asha Impact, you know, we our trust over there. We have an impact investing arm, which is focused on like more venture capital investing, but we have trust, which Aparna runs who's on, on the screen here, um, is to really kind of be one of the catalysts along with social finance and others on really getting uh, getting folks in the government, in the philanthropy area, educated on this and comfortable with it. It's a new way of doing business and it's a new way of spending. I mean, even in the US, you know, people are just oriented towards a budget. Okay, I, here's my budget for this year. This is what I'm going to spend on healthcare and education, et cetera. And then I go to the next year's budget and again, next year's budget. 
But this whole area of outcome-based funding is a new concept, which I'm hopefully we can educate a lot more folks on. Yeah, um, thank you, Vikram. And obviously, I completely echo your uh, optimism and sentiments. Uh, otherwise, it would be foolish for me to be doing this job. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're Santu, You're the one who is going to be that early success story, which is going to transform the blended finance industry in India. So we're That's all depending on you. That will be a multi-star movie. Hopefully, I'll be one of the, <laughs> one of the players in that. Uh, so yeah, with that, uh, I think we will come to the come to we have come to the end of the time um, again. Thank you, everybody who have come in. Uh, I know for India, it's been it's a late on a Friday evening, so obviously you're deeply interested. So really, thank you for the interest and the and and the patience and the questions that you've asked. Uh, thanks, Ashna Impact and uh, Naj for pulling this together, and Vikram, thanks again a lot for joining early morning. Thank you, thank you, Shantan. Thanks for being here, and thank you everyone for participating. Bye. Thank you. Have a good weekend.